Okay, well, good, good morning. Uh, it's uh, great to be in the second session um, because the talk I'm going to give runs somewhat in parallel to the beautiful talk that Paul Alavisatos gave. Um, and it's a talk about how persistent, determined effort and occasional discovery with advanced materials can actually make a real difference. Um, it's a story of work in progress, uh, so I'm going to present a different paradigm for what I think is going to be the next great thing in solar cells. And I hope the message that comes across is that what happens in research is that we don't know uh, what's going to happen, and it's great f to try different paths and see how they work. So the voyage, uh, for me, was started more than 20 years ago, at a time when physicists became interested in uh, molecules, colored molecules, as potential silicon-like semiconductors. Uh, almost anything that nature makes that is colorful is colorful for a reason. Uh, and a lot of the time, of course, it's colorful to absorb sunlight and convert the energy from photons into initially electrical energy and then chemical energy. The, the general characteristic of something that is colored, if it's carbon-based, is that it's got lots and lots of double bonds, or alternating single and double carbon bonds, in this case along a polymer chain, or maybe within a molecule. And it's those double bonds which um, involve uh, so-called pi electrons uh, that have um, energies that lie within the r range of energies of photons in the visible part of the spectrum. So the energy difference between filled pi orbitals and empty pi star orbitals, we can tune right the way through the visible spectrum. And of course, that's what nature does to make colorful molecules. So this particular polymer chain, um, which um, looks more or less like this little bottle of fluorescent paint, was of great interest to us uh, because we discovered we could make light-emitting diodes with it 20 years ago. Um, and those have turned out to be pretty useful. In terms of what sort of science are we doing, um, we sort of sit rather uncomfortably at the crossover between chemistry and semiconductor physics. So a semiconductor physicist would say, well, that particular polymer chain, I can overlay it onto a honeycomb network, which is, of course is the structure of a single sheet of um, graphite or graphene. And we would say it's just like a semiconductor. We have electrons and holes that are free to move anywhere um, up and down the molecule. Uh, but if you came from a chemistry background, you'd say, well, um, we have lots of colorful molecules, so here's a little short piece of that polymer, and they, too, are very fluorescent. So a lot of the uh, challenge in trying to understand how these materials work and how we can engineer them has to do with um, understanding how large electron wave functions are. It's uh, absolutely not trivial. So something we did, which is uh, almost embarrassingly simple to put up on a slide, uh, was to simply make a stack um, of materials. We have on a glass substrate a transparent metal, indium tin oxide, and then we had literally painted a layer of our polymer, that's the green layer, onto it, and then evaporated a rather reactive metal, usually, on top. Um, and we found that these very simple diode structures emit light the same fluorescence that you could see in that image of the sort of fluorescent paint, we could generate not by absorbing UV and re-radiating as yellow-green, but by pushing um, an electron down, actually from the top electrode in this case, down into the green polymer, um, and pushing a positive charge, a hole, up from the bottom electrode. And where electron meets hole in the layer, uh, we get light out. Now, we weren't the first to discover that organics can emit light. Um, in fact, that goes ba way back to the 1960s. But a really important event um, was uh, uh, the report from uh, the, the Kodak group, Ching Tang, uh, back in 1987, that it's possible to make quite sophisticated organic semiconductor diodes by stacking different layers of organic semiconductors with different energy levels. Uh, all within the same device, and that allows a very high level of control of where electron meets hole, and that has been immensely significant. Why is this frozen? 
Okay, the... Uh, so, uh, this is determinedly not in phase with my computer. Right. So, w one, you might ask why bother with organics when inorganics do a good job? And almost always the answer to that question is that if you want to use a technology, it isn't the science of how it works that matters, it's the engineering of how you make it that matters. And with our carbon-based materials, much as with the nanocrystals that uh, Paul spoke about, um, it's possible to um, solution process. So, um, whereas a lot of semiconductor technology with silicon is all high temperatures and high vacuums, uh, biology, of course, is around room temperature and in solution. Uh, we're not quite doing biology, but to be able to pattern different organic light emitters, uh, red, green, and blue, uh, to create a full color display is obviously attractive. And one of the things we did a lot of work with um, was being able to inkjet print, not ink that is just a, a color on a piece of paper, but the functional semiconductor that will emit red or green or blue at the right place um, on a display. So I've started with organic um, electroluminescence or organic light emitting diodes because that has turned out to be a very significant technology, uh, principally uh, through the uh, vacuum deposition systems that came from Kodak and that Samsung have exploited. But if you have a Samsung smartphone, um, when you look at the display, you're staring at a few million organic light emitting diodes. Um, they are surprisingly, uh, for those of us who've struggled with them over the years, surprisingly efficient and long-lived. A um, huge amount of engineering which works that. Uh, w which has been done to make all that work. Um, it's v uh, and of course, it's the smartphone that has uh, really pioneered the so-called active matrix organic LED. But they can be very big. Um, you can buy very big OLED TVs if you're very rich and probably foolish because they'll be cheaper next year. Um, uh, and some of them look fantastic. So Panasonic has a 4K resolution curved screen that is made by inkjet printing of the red, the green, and the blue. Um, and uh, uh, even more exciting and probably of uh, greater long-term consequence is that lighting panels can be made with organics and they can be extremely efficient. And, and panels rather than point light sources uh, are actually what we want for interior lighting. Uh, I think I just have to wait, yes. So. I put this slide up because um, I think sometimes we have to ask these questions. Um, and it provides a segue into what I think is a much more serious issue, which I shall get onto, which is energy. Um, uh, but before I do that, um, for some reason, there is a hugely slow transfer between... Right, okay. I was going to show you a small movie. Um, it turns out we can do anything with organic semiconductors. Uh, we can make transistors um, pretty well, and the nice thing about those is they're made at room temperature, so we can put them on bits of plastic and make bendy displays. Um, but here is a device, uh, it's a transistor. It's got a source, a drain, a gate, an insulator, and a layer of yellow-green fluorescent semiconductor, which is that one. It happens to be that polymer for those who like it. It's a transistor, and it's a transistor which emits light, which is unusual. Um, so what we do is we bias it so that we induce holes near the source and electrons near the drain. And we've got a voltage between the source and the drain, and that the electrons and holes are pulled together. And where they meet somewhere in the channel, uh, we get light out. So I, I had given you a little run through of uh, uh, progress in making light emission from organics. Uh, but the big challenge uh, in, that we have to face is, is energy. It's the reverse process, and that's um, solar cells, um, which, of course, have got good, but they need to be better. And the overwhelming observation that one has to start with about solar energy is that there is actually enough of it. Uh, there's a vast amount of sunlight that lands on the globe. This is a Nate Lewitz uh, from Caltech slide from a little while ago. 
Um, but the land area for 10% efficient solar cells to generate current power consumption in the US, that's all power, um, is that little red box in the center. It's about the size of the state of Kansas. Um, and you can have a discussion over lunch as to whether you think it's worth sacrificing Kansas. Um, um, but there is no other form of energy on the, that we have access to that is so limitless. So, like it or not, in 20, 50, 100 years' time, we will use a lot of solar energy. Now, Paul mentioned that um, one of the huge breakthroughs in the last few years has been the uh, remarkable collapse in the cost, so first the price and then the cost, of silicon solar cells. So this is the price in um, module um, uh, price per peak watt falling from $5 in the mid-1990s down to about half a dollar today. And as Paul mentioned, around $1 a watt was considered to be break-even point. What's, what, what I think is really interesting is that the cost of solar cells has fallen so fast that it is now passing through the cost of nuclear. Uh, we're about to build, apparently about to build some new nuclear generation in the UK. The subsidy required to pay for it to get a commercial operator um, is about the same as the subsidy over fossil fuels um, that's required for solar. And what's clear is that nuclear will carry on getting more expensive and solar will carry on becoming less expensive. So we've passed a really significant crossing point. But nevertheless, and again, I'm running in parallel to Paul, um, there's a long way to go with solar. Uh, Paul talked about this payback time. How long does a solar cell have to be switched on before it's generated enough energy uh, to match what was expended in making it and putting it where it was? Um, and around a year, a year and a half um, in sunnier parts of the world, about two years um, this far north, like the UK. But n not bad, uh, but not good. Uh, if we look at what nature does, uh, here's a field of maize. Maize is, I think, has the highest energy conversion efficiency of sunlight into biomass. The payback time for a leaf to have... Um, produced more energy than was needed to make it is probably a few days. So silicon is a few years, nature is a few days. We've got a factor of 365 to go. That is the opportunity. Now, nature, of course, manages to make huge quantities of extraordinarily elaborate structures. So here is an image um, from, of what's there in a green leaf. That really is one of the challenges of nanotechnology for those of us who do things sort of bottom up. How can we get that exquisite functionality um, on a large scale? Um, well, we do something much less exquisite with um, thin film solar cells simply by mixing together um, different components. And one of the, there are lots of, there are lots of different materials solutions out in the literature. Uh, and the key, if we want to get a good solar cell to work with a thin film um, material uh, system, particularly if we use molecules, is that we have to have two materials, one which will absorb light and, and then transfer an electron to the other, a donor and an acceptor. And they have to be, the junctions between them have to be rather close together, otherwise light is absorbed too far away from that junction. So there's been a huge amount of work producing uh, these sort of interpenetrating nanoscale mixtures of donors and acceptors. And I won't run through the whole list of it, but you can do it with all organics, you can do it with organic and inorganic, or all inorganic. It's a very exciting, very important space for nanotechnology. Uh, and what can it produce? Well, the all organic versions, um, it's not quite a, a leaf, um, but it's, we can start with a roll of plastic substrate and thus add by printing the different layers that make up a solar cell. Um, it can be done in vacuum as well. This is a Heliotech example. Uh, they don't match silicon efficiencies yet, but there's far less stuff in the solar cell. It's, it's almost leaf-like in that respect. Um, so that may work. Um, uh, it, uh, it'll have to sort of win on economics, not science, of course. But the science has been, is, 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 is actually m more surprising than I think some people had expected. Um, and there are very interesting parallels with what I'm just going to say uh, in photosynthesis too. So what I told you is that we need to transfer an electron 
from the donor, um, where the electron has been photo excited up to a high energy, to drop down to a lower energy on the acceptor. And the presumption is that it just happens one molecule that is the donor and another molecule that is the acceptor, and once we've got the electron in the hole, the electron across, leaving the hole behind, then they wander away from one another. But that actually makes little sense because there are very, very strong electrostatic interactions keeping the electron and hole together. Plus and minus charges pull together very strongly. Um, so uh, actually, the electron has to uh, work over, pull itself up a potential barrier, and it's quite large. It's about, we think it's about 0.2 in an electron volt. It's about 10 times random thermal energy at room temperature. So, um, so what happens is the electron moving into the acceptor and the hole moving um, uh, back into the donor is that they set up lines of electric field, and those lines of electric field have a lot of energy associated with them, and you really have to work up. So the question is, how does the electron, if it drops down, how does it ever get uphill again? Um, because, of course, if the electron uh, hangs around too close to um, the hole, they'll just recombine and it'll be game over. Um, and what some of us have been looking at um, is that the systems that work uh, require quantum coherent effects. So the electron actually manages to simultaneously explore not just the nearest molecule to the donor, but many, many other molecules. So the electron can propagate as a coherent wave extremely quickly. Uh, it manages to make, it's a short distance, five nanometers, but it does it in less than... 40 femtoseconds. It's traveling pretty quickly if you work it out. So it's rather unexpected, um, but it suggests that sort of, um, sort of quantum processes are actually alive and well in a, a large number of molecular systems. That's a very active area. So I wanted to switch now to um, run absolutely the parallel, my, my, my parallel approach to uh, how we're going to make solar more efficient to, to Paul's. And I'm going to concentrate on the inefficiency of how standard um, solar cells use the spectrum. The problem with photons is they come in all colors. Uh, infrared ones, lots of them, but they don't have very much energy. Um, the, if I measure energy in electron volts, um, uh, visible photons are somewhere between two and three electron volts, and then infrared um, at lower energies. So let's take a silicon solar cell, which absorbs out to about um, 1,100 nanometers, which is about 1.1 electron volts. The red part of the spectrum, so we go, by the time we get to 700, we're into the visible. Here is the visible. And silicon goes some way out in the infrared, but there's still quite a lot of photons further, uh, further into the infrared that are not absorbed. We have to make a choice what fraction of the spectrum to absorb, and that's what silicon does. So that looks good because all that red area, we absorb the photons, but it's less good because we don't get all the energy. Now, there are some entropy problems, um, losses, which Paul spoke about, but there's also what's generally called thermalization. And that is that with the, if we select what color the, 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 the semiconductor is, and if it's silicon, it's infrared, that fixes how large the voltage is going to be. So 1.1 EV solar cell with some various losses, you get down to about 0.8 volts out. But by the time you get into the visible, it's not 1.1 EV in a photon, it's up, at, up to 3. So the difference between 3 and 1.1 is thrown away as heat. That's the thermalization loss. So it would be very nice to be able to um, slice up the spectrum and use each part of it more efficiently. Um, and as Paul mentioned, that allows, um, in principle, to get beyond the 33% efficiency limit, which um, I've described there. So here's um, work in progress. We haven't made it all work yet, we, so uh, um, you may note uh, this may or may not fly, um, but uh, this is what we're trying to do at the moment in, in my group. If we could take a standard silicon solar cell, and they are pretty cheap now, um, and find uh, a layer of uh, buy one, get one free um, paint. Um, that's the supermarket slogan in the UK. Um, so this buy one, get one free paint will absorb the sort of yellow through to blue and UV photons and convert the energy from one photon into two excitations. And then I feed those two excitations down to the silicon and I'll do better. So there's my magic paint. Um, and um, 
everything will work. It, it's a wonderfully simple solution. Now, actually, there are a number of different approaches to trying to do that um, splitting of one quantum of energy into two at half that value. Uh, and the one that we're interested in um, has to do with electron spin. So if I wander off into a small amount of technical detail for a moment, um, uh, it's all in a good cause. So if I can represent a molecule or a semiconductor unexcited in the ground state, we pair electrons up, spin up and spin down, into valence states. And of course, we have no electrons in unoccupied um, conduction band states or antibonding states, and everything is happy. We've got no um, electrons. Um, you, you, we have to, the Fermi principle means we have to put electrons in spin up, spin down into one quantum state. Now, if I excite that system, uh, for example, if I've absorbed, uh, used a photon to lift one electron up to an empty level, and it's still in that so-called spin-singlet state where the spins are anti-parallel, that's good. That will um, re-emit light pretty well. But the, um, the uh, Pauli principle um, no longer applies here, and I could have put um, the two electrons to have parallel spins. Um, and if, if I put two spin-a-half objects to make a spin-one object, um, then there are three ways of, orient, of organizing it, so that's why it's called a triplet. Now, that um, doesn't, do, I've, um, doesn't emit light very well, um, because um, it's, there's a spin, it's a spin-forbidden process um, to, uh, for that electron to drop down, because it can't, it's got to change spin as it drops down. So if you do end up with um, um, the wrong um, spin state, uh, you don't get light out. So uh, triplet excitons um, are sort of always lurking there with organics. And the problem is that um, the triplet state, where the two electrons are spin parallel, is lower in energy than the singlet state. Um, it's to do with the um, anti-correlation of their spatial wave function. So they keep out of one another's way, and they drop to a lower energy state. So triplets are there, quite a lot lower in energy, and they're a real problem for an organic LED, because when I bring electrons and holes together, um, injected from you know, opposite electrodes in the diode, they don't know about one another's spin. So randomly, only one time out of four do we get the singlet, and three out of four, we get a triplet. And that limits the efficiency um, of uh, LEDs quite se severely. But there have been workarounds. One of them that um, we've been interested in is that uh, because the triplet excited states can't re-radiate, they hang around for a long time, and eventually they must be broken up. Um, and an, an important decay mechanism is that they collide with one another and if they happen to collide so overall their spin zero, they can regenerate a singlet. Um, and that process of two triplets um, fusing to form one singlet actually accounts for a lot of the efficiency in um, today's um, OLED displays. So that's a process of triplet-triplet fusion. Now, the nice thing with organics is that you can rearrange um, uh, energy levels um, through there's this huge variety of organic chemistry. Um, and of a particular class of materials where we have these fused benzene rings, pentacene particularly, the um, energy difference between singlet and triplet is so large that the triplet lies down at half the singlet energy. So I can produce a singlet excited state by absorbing a photon, and if it wanted to, it could split into two triplets, um, actually to have to be quantum entangled over all spin zero. Um, and the amazing thing is that that can happen extremely efficiently. Um, it's one of the things we've been measuring. It happens with 200% efficiency. So that's a process of fission. And of course, it's fission if the singlet has more than twice the energy of the triplet, and fusion if the two triplets have got more energy than the singlet. Either process works, and it works really efficiently. So here's our scheme for making a better solar cell. We um, take, on top of a piece of silicon, a mixture of materials uh, one of which will take visible photons, split them into two triplet excitons, and then we have to do some magic. And the magic actually uses nanocrystals. Uh, we want to transfer the triplet energy into a nanocrystal, uh, which will then allow it to re-radiate. 
um, and then we get um, these infrared photons here that then go down into the silicon cell. Uh, and if that were to work, then our thermalization losses are much reduced. We get the blue um, efficiency curve rather than the red as we are there in the visible. And in principle, if you're a real optimist, the efficiency goes from 33 to 45%. I mean, it's quite a big win. Um, now, it's pretty difficult. Uh, we don't, there's, there's very little that's known about what you can do to manipulate these spin triplet objects. Um, but there are a couple of papers that came back to back um, in Nature Materials um, last month uh, where uh, we had both independently been discovering that we could move these spin triplet excitons into lead sulfide or lead selenide nanocrystals and essentially it's completely efficient. So there's a chance, of, you know, several ifs and buts, there's a chance that we might be able to make a really good solar cell like that. Well, to conclude, I'm just going to walk you through this slide. Um, one of the things that happens in many universities is that professors um, start companies, um, particularly in the US, um, occasionally in Europe, um, and quite a lot in Cambridge. Um, and I'm involved in a company which is a spin-off of a spin-off, um, which is selling um, cheap energy, particularly lighting, in Africa. It's a company called Azuri Technologies. Um, and the proposition um, you can see uh, from the images, uh, what, um, what the package is, is a solar cell. This happens to be one of our polymer, uh, plastic polymer, um, solar cells, um, which generates electricity during the day. It's stored in a battery, and the battery uh, turns out to be a very advanced lithium-ion battery because they have really good recycling. It's a lithium-ion phosphate battery. And then at night time, the light um, is from a gallium nitride LED. Now, what, when this works well, in fact, when it works at all, it halves the cost of lighting in Africa because the current form of lighting is burning paraffin or kerosene which is surprisingly expensive. It's also toxic. There's a large um, detriment to health if you burn kerosene lamps indoors. So with no subsidy, it's possible to produce a more effective form of lighting, and lighting brings education, and education um, is universally a good thing. I think I can say that. Um, so the little catch is that um, solar is a bit like nuclear, um, in that you have to pay everything up front, and the cost of operation is then close to zero. So this company is trying to work out how to run um, a pay-as-you-go scheme, a bit like cell phones, where essentially you rent rather than paying up front, because the big challenge is to get that penetration. But the nice thing about this is that all three elements here, the battery, the solar cell, the LED lamp, didn't exist a decade ago, or certainly two decades ago, with sufficient performance, and it's that real advance of, of um, materials-based technologies that has produced something which we may look back on and see as having been transformational. I'll stop there. this on? No, it's not on. Is it? Okay. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Thanks. Um, do we have questions? Complete silence. <laughs> Hello, Professor. Thank you for your report. I have two questions. One is just, uh, if you make the polymer cells to enter into the uh, maybe it's through printer. So I just uh, wonder the printer device is uh, maybe the bottom up is also the pitot the solution, and the active layer is a polymer. Uh, what's your opinion about the printer? Maybe the printer is a, is a measure to make the polymer cell into industrialization. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. So the, the specific question was, what was my opinion on? A printer for polymer cells. A printer, yes. Um, printing may be good. Um, uh, and uh, at the moment, very simple um, 
sort of slot coating techniques um, will work quite well, or um, gravure printing. Uh, anything that uh, will produce a very uniform film, and we want to do it fast, and, we, and pr printing, of course, works around room temperature. So yes, that's, um, there's been a huge interest in you know, like reapplying well-known technologies, such as printing, to these advanced applications. Yep. Okay, okay, the second question. Uh, maybe if you order to get the high EQE efficiency, we should use a triplet. So uh, there are two views about that, how to use a triplet. One is to maybe the double triplet to get the single lead, just your talk. Another from the just uh, Chikaya Adach from the Japan groups, use the TADF. He says if the uh, energy gap between the triplet and the singular is very small, so just triplet can get the uh, singlet. What's your opinion about these two views to increase the triplet to get a high EQE efficiency? Are we talking about solar cells or, or LEDs? The um, LEDs. For the LEDs. Yeah. I, I, I went very briefly over the issue of spin for the LEDs, but there are uh, uh, about three different approaches, uh, all of which look very exciting. Uh, if you can engineer the, the exchange energy down to a small value, then you can just get singlet emission. If you can put in a heavy metal that will mix singlet and triplet states, then you can get efficient emission. Um, but a, a lot of what's done today, certainly for blue LEDs, does use this triplet-triplet fusion process because it produces very stable devices. But you're right, there are lots of options. I don't know what's going to win. It, it's both science and economics. Okay, thank you. Oh, there, please. In front of us. Please wait for the microphone. Oh, oh, okay, well, that sounds fine. Uh, Well, for the, so the question was um, triplets take a long time to decay um, and therefore are not very efficient as light emitters. Um, now, the fact that they take a long time to decay is good because it means we've got them for a long time if we want to move them somewhere. But then if we want them to emit light, we want to transfer them into something from which they can emit. So that's why uh, these lead sulfide and lead selenide nanocrystals have proved, look so interesting because once we've got the triplet to those, that the spin states are scrambled and they will emit efficiently. I don't see any raised arms right now. Um, I think we will save questions for the panel discussion then. And thank you very much, Richard.